Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the World's Most Dangerous Morning Show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy is not here, but we have a very special guest. Uh, Mr. Secretary Pete Buttigieg is here. What's happening, my brother? Good to be with you. How are you, man? I'm good. Like, I'm, really good? Like, you're good, good? I'm good, good. I have a great job. It's summer. The, the you know, life is returning to cities. I'm starting to travel again. It Absolutely. was very strange the first few weeks and months when you're in charge of transportation and you're not <laughs> traveling, right? Oh. Because the, the, the pandemic <laughs> yeah, restrictions. Ironic. So now that we're on the move more, I feel a little more uh, like things are the way they're supposed to be in the job. We were and talking about you being in New York and going to a concert. Is that your first concert, like, since the pandemic? Yeah, it was It was the comeback of Broadway, the, the Springsteen show uh, Saturday night, and it was just moving to be in a theater again with, with, with people everywhere and, and a good show. So, uh, yeah, it was the first time we'd been in New York and definitely the first time I'd been around that many people in, what, a year and a half. Well, I'm glad that you still care about our audience man because other democrats don't you make us feel special when you come when you don't need something well you know what i mean <laughs> nobody's saying he doesn't need something now because there's some things you're trying to get accomplished right and bring attention to yeah it. we need an infrastructure bill that's for sure yeah but we're not voting for it you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. but, but what's in the infrastructure bill Bo both versions the, the compromise and the, the the democratic bill the original bill Right. So the original bill, the American Jobs Plan, that's mm -hmm. the president's overall vision for infrastructure. It's the biggest investment in a generation, uh, lead pipes, internet access, not just transportation infrastructure, but uh, what you might call human infrastructure. So making sure we're, we're making it more affordable to uh, get child care, elder care, building out veterans hospitals. There's a whole span of things. Mm -hmm. a, ch a piece of that is part of this bipartisan bill. And it's a good piece of that. You've got uh, the, the biggest investment in passenger rail since Amtrak, major investment in public transit, roads and bridges, uh, the broadband piece, making sure everybody can get internet access. Other parts will have to happen in another bill. So uh, some of the work on housing that we're very committed to is an example of what will likely go in, in what's called the reconciliation track, which is the part that will not have, uh, likely will not have a lot of Republican support. But the, this bipartisan bill is one that we're really proud of and mm -hmm. really excited to see through because I think everybody knows just how much we need to invest. We've been disinvesting for decades and it's caught up to us as a country. Why is it always compromises on what the people need though? I don't ever see that with corporations. Corporations seem to get what they want, but when it comes to the people, it has to be a compromise. Why? Well, we keep pushing because we think that the, the people hired us to do this, and that's what we're focused on. So you look at, uh, for example, public transit is, is one of the things that there was not a lot of support for on the other side of the aisle, but the president was really pushing it. And we mm -hmm. got to a bipartisan deal that's the biggest investment, I think the biggest federal investment ever in public transit. Uh, you know, I, I wish we could get bipartisan support on all of these things, especially because there is bipartisan support on a lot of these things among the American people. Mm -hmm. and it's not always reflected in Congress. It's the same thing with the American Rescue Plan, right? Uh, Americans from both parties wanted us to do it. It's a good thing that we did it. It's going to cut child poverty in half. But um, just because it was popular across America doesn't mean it was necessarily popular on Capitol Hill. Why is it that? Is it conservative spending? Is it that we just don't want to agree with Democrats? What is the reason for yeah, that? Yeah, I think some of it's that, that politics, right? They, they will think twice before wanting to give the, the, the other party a win. But uh, again, our view on, on the transportation infrastructure is this is a win for everybody. Who wouldn't want to go home to their district, I don't care how red or blue it is, and say, I helped make sure that this bridge came uh, got built. Uh, I, I helped make sure this, this bus route got saved or expanded. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're finding uh, some space in, in a, a Washington that's probably more divided than it's ever been, at, at least around these pieces. How does this affect black and brown people? Well, a, a, a lot. I mean, first of all, uh, you know, black people are three to four times more likely than white people to depend on public transit. So when we're talking about making sure that buses and, and subways and other public transit assets are funded, uh, that's good for everybody. It's good for the country. It's good for communities. But it's definitely good for the black community. Uh, you look at safety. Uh, you know, it's, it's safety is this kind of sometimes it's treated as an unglamorous subject. It doesn't sound uh, it doesn't sizzle like some of the other things we talk about in transportation, but it's a huge deal. We've actually been moving in the wrong direction in the last year in terms of traffic fatalities. And this is disproportionately happened to black people. So the investments, billions that we have in, in this compromise bill for safety. Uh, I think will make a big difference. Also, we're, we're uh, for the first time, I, I think, at least at this level, committing dollars to reconnecting communities. So the idea here is you have a lot of places where a highway went through or some uh, public transportation or uh, public spending on transportation went through. 
you know, with with taxpayer dollars that often destroyed a black neighborhood or or served to segregate. This is true in Atlanta. You you see just the way some of the highways run and they divide mm-hmm. the black part of town from the from the white part of town. And we have dollars to actually go out of our way to reconnect across those divides. I think that's huge. And and again, good for everybody, uh, but certainly says a lot to the black community that was on the short end of a lot of these investments in the past. You know, Joe Biden. I've heard him talk about a, a second great railroad revolution hmm. and uh, Dr. Claude Anderson who's the author of Powernomics he has this idea for a high speed rail that travels through through five states I actually sent it uh, to your man Benjamin but what, what does Joe Biden look like if there is one so Joe Biden is probably the number one train enthusiast I've ever met mm-hmm. um, and I'm trying to be number two in, in this administration on, on passenger rail uh, before we even talk about high speed we've got to do something about our regular speed rail assets so uh, in fact uh, Today, while I'm in New York, we're, we're looking at uh, the Hudson Tunnel and some of the uh, pieces of infrastructure that are 100 years old. Mm-hmm. If they failed, we saw what it, happened in Miami and um, Florida yes, with right. that. So imagine that happening in a tunnel. Or if if we lost one of these tunnels, the the economic consequence. I mean, the the entire Northeast corridor depends on it. But you would feel the economic pain all the way in Indiana, where I'm from, because mm-hmm. it would be so disruptive. So so first of all, we got to take care of what we've got. Mm-hmm. But also, we need to add more. You know, if if you live in Japan, Turkey, China, Italy, England, almost any developed economy, you can count on a higher level of speed and service than you can in the US. It's it's not that Amtrak has done anything wrong. They've done an incredible job with the dollars they've been given. But as a country, we haven't invested the way that most countries are. And we're, we're, we're paying for that. So the president believes, and, and, and I believe, in making sure that we demonstrate that, that America can do high-speed rail just as well as anybody. I would describe what's in this bill as a, a down payment on that, on that great rail revolution. It's not going to build a full-on mm-hmm. nationwide high-speed network yet, but it will contain some of the dollars that, that we would need in order to start connecting city pairs with high-speed rail to, to show that we can do this in America and do it better than anybody. I don't know why Americans should settle for less when Word. it comes to high-speed rail. How far away are, are that, you think, we from? How far away from that are we, you think? I think we can we can get there at least in certain geographies mm-hmm. uh, in the next few years. That's what Dr. Uh, Claude had. He had five states, so people that work that live mm-hmm. in these five states could work in all these different five mm-hmm. states by traveling on this high-speed rail. Right, and that's the thing. It opens up work opportunities mm-hmm. for people. So yep. when we say this is going to create economic opportunity and jobs, it's not just the jobs of the people who get to work on the railroad construction or the jobs of the people who get to install the electric vehicle chargers, although that's huge and that's mm-hmm. part of why this is the, the biggest investment in jobs in, in, in a generation or more. But but it's also the jobs that it unlocks. If, if you think about your distance, the way you live, the distance between your home and your workplace, you don't really experience it in miles. You experience it in, in minutes, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. If it's 30 miles and that's 30 right. minutes, that's different from if it's three miles and, and 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's part of what's possible when you have better train connections. So uh, I think the first step is is to demonstrate that we as a country can do it. Some things are underway. Uh, you know, California's got high-speed rail uh, that they're putting together, but it's going to take years to be operational. There's an interesting project in, in Texas that's being uh, discussed. And, and you don't think of Texas as, you know, a place where people are, are I think a lot of people picture rail as a coastal city thing, but actually it's in those wide open spaces that it might uh, have the biggest impact to have true high-speed rail. The Midwest, yeah. where I come from, would be yeah. huge to have all those cities connected to be within a couple hours of each other. We live in like Flintstones. We should be living like Jetsons, man. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We absolutely I don't should. know if the flying cars are coming just yet, but uh, yeah. we're behind. And people got the, all, all we need is the money because people have the ideas. Like I said, Dr. Claude Anderson has been talking about this for years. Yeah. And, and people who live in other countries have it right now. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the, the distance from Beijing to Shanghai is basically the same as Chicago to Atlanta. And uh, they have a high-speed train you can do in about four hours. Wow. Uh, why shouldn't Americans be able to expect that? When you think about economics also, are they making sure that some of these contracts go to like minority and women-owned businesses, just like in the airports? Yeah. They'll make sure that a certain percentage is allocated towards that? Yeah, this this is a really important part of it. So a couple things to mention. One, there's a principle uh, that the president's calling Justice 40. So the idea here is that on, on all of the environmental uh, investments that are being made in this bill that at least 40% should go to disadvantaged or overburdened communities that have borne the brunt of environmental injustice. Then on the contract piece that you're talking about, you know, uh, again, speaking of Atlanta, you know, Atlanta was a place where the airport construction that happened under Mayor Maynard Jackson 
unlocked an enormous amount of business opportunity, and the mayor made sure of it. Mm -hmm. They really helped build the black middle class in Atlanta. Uh, construction has always created tons of economic opportunity, uh, both for business owners and for workers getting into the building trades to get into the middle class. But uh, you talk to a lot of people, especially in, in, in black neighborhoods, where they'll have this experience of a big project comes to their area, mm -hmm. right? They look at the work site, and none of the people working on the work site look like them. And that's where we've got to work both with businesses and, and with labor, with organized labor, to make sure that, that those opportunities are being created. And that's, that's really important to this administration. And if we're going to put an unprecedented number, at least in modern times, of, of billions of dollars through the system, we've got to make sure that those dollars reach everybody in an equitable way. Otherwise, it's a huge missed opportunity. Uh, now, in our department, we have specific programs for making sure that uh, the DBEs get access to, uh, uh, to to these kinds of business opportunities, but we could be doing more, and, right. and that's what we're working on. Okay. What, what does a jobs plan mean specifically for black people? Well, um, first of all, there, there's the spending benefits I talked about earlier, right? So more transit, uh, more safety investments, that, that's going to mean a lot uh, for, for black Americans, but also the jobs themselves, mm -hmm. right? That's part of what we want to make sure happens here. Uh, when you put this much federal money into good needed infrastructure projects, you're also creating opportunity and potentially creating a business base mm -hmm. that can then grow opportunity for generations, grow wealth as families work to build generational wealth. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I think is important is addressing the cost for ordinary people just to, to get through life, where if you add housing plus transportation, it is a huge part of people's budgets, especially uh, especially black and uh, not just black. All lower income Americans face a disproportionate. Yeah, I want uh, specifically this, black, but though. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if you look at the numbers mm -hmm. on uh, black families' budgets and how much of that goes to transportation, for example, it, it's one of the reasons why racial justice is absolutely part of what's at stake in something as technical sounding as transportation spending. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the need to reconnect communities. I mean, and this is not just one part of the country. In the north as well as in the south. Here in New York, the story of the Cross Bronx, Cross Bronx Expressway and how that uh, cut through black neighborhoods. Uh, addressing that, I think, is a, a generational and moral responsibility for mm -hmm. a country that used federal dollars to, to divide. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the, the opportunity for the black community that's represented in this jobs plan is, is part of what makes me so excited about it. How, how transformational is the child tax credit going to be? I mean, cutting child poverty in half is an unbelievable achievement, mm -hmm. uh, seeing that through from the rescue plan. I'm glad you raised that because a lot of this was in the rescue plan that we just passed, and we're already moving on to the next thing. Right? Mm -hmm. We're already talking, about, as we should be, we're talking about the infrastructure bill, we're, we're talking about what we can do in reconciliation, but what we just did in, in, in the first weeks of this, this president's leadership is, is incredible. And sometimes it's the basics, like families that are poor need more money to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's we overcomplicate things. Absolutely. It's that simple, and that's what the child tax credit does. I think it's a I think it's a moral as well as an economic question, mm -hmm. and uh, we're we're doing the right thing, and it's going to pay off. Now, another thing that's been coming up is obviously voter restriction laws yeah. that are being passed, and I see now the DOJ is suing uh, Georgia. So, can you talk a little bit about that and how we can make sure that our rights aren't taken away from us? Yeah, the Department of Justice is taking action because what you see in Georgia uh, is full of red flags of uh, racially oriented voter restrictions. And it, I think it reflects, you know, if you find you're not winning with a certain demographic, um, to me, that's a signal to a political campaign or a political party that you've got to work harder to earn those votes. The other strategy would be to just have fewer of those voters able to vote. And it puts you at a, at a moral crossroads as a country if the state seems to be moving in that direction. Uh, so this administration's commitment, you've seen it in, in our support for bills which unfortunately have not moved through the Senate. But you're also going to see it in action, like the Department of Justice putting uh, uh, putting this Georgia case on, on the forefront and saying, uh, you know, you, you can't take steps that have disparate impact on black voters or, or any community of voters, especially if that's the purpose of it. Uh, every other right that we have, and Justice Garland, or, or um, sorry, Attorney General Garland spoke eloquently about this, all of our other rights flow from the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And when voters' ability to access that right is diminished, America is diminished. 
You think Democrats aren't aggressive enough when it comes to things like this happening? I think it's it's rightly central in our agenda. We're also dealing with the reality of a structure in the Senate, in, in the Congress, that has made it hard for measures that the president supports and that the party supports, like uh, the, the voting rights work that, that we've been trying to do to get through. That's why I think the, the backstop is the Justice Department, but that shouldn't be the only tool in our toolkit. And uh, you know, some of it can be done through organizing, incredible work that was done on the ground, what Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. was doing in Georgia and a lot of other states are trying to replicate, but, but that can't be enough. I mean, the, the policy has to be there too. It just seems strange to me because it's like it seems like it's Democrats blocking other Democrats. Like Joe Manchin pushed back on uh, what, what Bernie presented in regards to the infrastructure plan. Like, why? That's the thing about our party, right? It, it's just got a bigger range to it than the other party that mm -hmm. seems to be in lockstep. But uh, I also think that at a certain point, the American people expect us to deliver. Absolutely. And that's part of what's creating the propulsion for things like the infrastructure work. How do you think Democrats holding up progress in this country is going to impact y'all in 2022? And 2024. I mean, look, we, we have to get these things done. Uh, we have, obviously, the way the Senate works, the filibuster, it's not like we get to do whatever we like. But at the end of the day, the Democratic Party has the presidency and both houses of, of Congress. We are going to be held accountable for how good of a job we do. Yeah, because y'all push for people to vote for, you know, to get control of the Senate, you get control of the Senate. But then now it's Joe Manchin and, and Kristen Sinema blocking everything. Well, that's the thing with a 50-50 Senate, right? It means any individual senator can shape any decision. But I also think that we're having a conversation about how we move forward and we're seeing just how high the expectations are from the American people because this is such an important moment. This window of two years is one where I think we're being watched very closely <clears throat> mm -hmm. as an administration. Again, I don't want to short what's already been delivered. Mm -hmm. The rescue plan alone in any other time in history would be a monumental achievement that a presidency could hang its hat on right then and there. But because of where our country is, with COVID, with the economy, with the disinvestment uh, in our, our infrastructure, with the, the, the outcry for racial justice and equality, with uh, what's happening to our democracy and voting rights, there is so much more to do. And we just got to keep pushing. Secretary Pete, do you think Joe Manchin is a problem? He seems like the new Mitch McConnell. I think that Joe Manchin and Mitch McConnell are very different people. I can't tell. They're um, both blocking progress. That's Well, I mean, we need to make sure that, that we get the 50 votes that we need for the, the things that we can move forward with 50 votes. Um, but we're, we're also in a world where every senator, uh, every single one of them in a 50-50 Senate can uh, either block or shape or unlock progress. But it's always him. Well, it depends on the bill, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the project. The ones but, that matter. Um, I mean, that bill really mattered to mm -hmm. a lot of us, right? And uh, I don't think that, that that day in the Senate is the last word on voting rights in this country. Um, as we said, there's a lot going on, on with the Department of Justice, um, but we do need to do more legislatively. There's just, there's no question about that. Who, who's really running the country? Is it Joe Biden or Joe Manchin? So it turns out in America, no one person runs the entire country. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's no senator, not even the president, who just gets to snap their fingers and have their way. We had a president who, who I think wanted to believe that, that <laughs> the president single-handedly decides what to do, but um, there's just more to it than that, for, for better and for worse. But you have to admit, Joe Manchin is a problem. I mean, he's a pain. He's got to be a pain in Democrat side, even though he is a Democrat. Well, look, he, he has presented uh, barriers on some things and possibilities on other things, as other senators do, too. I mean, again, mm -hmm. it doesn't grab the, the headlines uh, uh, the way uh, certain stories do. But, you know, any one senator who says, I'm not going to vote for it, it could be the most technical thing. It could mm -hmm. be some obscure thing I'm working on in the Department of Transportation. And if they're upset or concerned about something, they can single handedly stop the train in its tracks until we address it. Sometimes that can be good. It means that a problem or a state or a, a, a set of values doesn't get overlooked. But uh, our system, our Senate, our uh, setup that we have right now is definitely not designed for swift action. And that's what we need right now. It is. Do, do you think Joe Biden or Joe Manchin, whoever's running this country, like to Angelique's point, do they need to have a more aggressive approach to getting things done instead of always looking to work with Republicans all the time? These people, some of these people on the other side are blatantly racist blatantly big, bigots, blatantly on the wrong side of history. What's the point of trying to work with them? I think, I mean, I get it, but I also think it's easy to say, you know, you guys are not being aggressive enough. You guys are not pushing enough um, without saying what the plan is. I mean, at the end of the day, 
this administration and our allies in Congress are doing everything that can possibly be done in order to make as much progress as we possibly can. And mm -hmm. again, in any other season in history, what we've been doing right now, whether it's the rescue plan or the infrastructure stuff we're doing right now, would be considered lightning speed. Um, you know, infrastructure week has been a joke in Washington for mm -hmm. almost 10 years now, and we're actually making it happen now. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the other steps that we've taken are things that, that we have wanted to do for years and they're happening. So it's not a matter of how bad you want it or how much you shout from the rooftops that it's got to happen. It's literally a matter of how you craft the legislation, set up the policy, get the votes and get it to the president's desk. How just, frustrated do you get? I mean, look, there's so many things that I want to do, <laughs> <laughs> so many things that I want done yesterday. And even outside of my lane in transportation, things I would like to see happen much quicker. But having said all of that, we also have an opportunity on our hands that I think we have been craving for years. I mean, again, on, on my piece, the transportation piece, the chance to have the biggest federal investment in public transit ever, the chance to take uh, these issues we were talking about with highways, dividing neighborhoods, and do something about, you know, this is an issue that my predecessors raised. Anthony Fox, who was Secretary of Transportation under President Obama, was especially eloquent about this. But we never had a chance to mobilize the kinds of dollars we're potentially about to get to do something about it. So I could always think about how there's even more that we could do and mm -hmm. even more that I wish we had. But what we're about to deliver, if we can get this done, and that's a big, there are still a lot of steps between, between here and there. And even once there's passage of these bills, right, we, we've got actually implement and execute and sometimes that's the hardest part but if we can deliver that the 2020s will be remembered as one of the most dynamic times in american life it's just the matter of holding it all together it you know, we had a discussion last week about uh, businesses saying that you have to get vaccinated hmm. or you can't work there what do you think about mandatory vaccinations you know i think uh, uh that's not our policy in the administration for for our employees uh, there is a question about what steps businesses want to be able to take to protect their employees and and uh and to protect their customers uh we see this a lot in travel where you have for example cruise lines that mm -hmm. really want to be able to get uh up and running again uh but they they believe that the correctly that that the safety of uh of that cruise depends a lot on being able to understand the vaccination status of the passengers so uh, you know we we need to be ready to do what it takes to be safe as a country and work with with businesses or individuals uh, who who are trying to do the right thing and make it easier and not harder. So you think they could make that decision? You're supporting that they make that decision based on their own I mean, protocol. I mean, I want to get out of my depth a little bit in terms of, uh, right. uh, you know, public health and, and, uh, and some of the legal questions that come up. But what I know is that, you know, for people, especially things like retail businesses, uh, for them to do well, people need to feel safe mm -hmm. uh, and workers need to be safe. Uh, now, we also have a, a, a lot of workers and, and a lot of people who work at companies who still have questions about whether the vaccine is safe. That's one of the reasons why we're really pushing right now people who have questions to go to vaccines.gov and get more information or to talk to a doctor that they trust and get more information. Because the only way we really get to, to where the pandemic is fully behind us is to have enough of the American people vaccinated that these variants can't spread and that, that uh, there's that level of protection where, where the math uh, adds up to, to uh, a kind of collective safety. And we've made incredible progress. It's why we're sitting here in a, in a room together. It's why I was able to be on Broadway uh, uh, Saturday enjoying a show, but, uh, but we've clearly got a long way to go. You fully vaccinated? Yeah. Both shots? Yep. Did you have any side effects after the second one? No, I felt a little crummy on the second one. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long were you down for? Um, I was just that day. I was just, I was just a little bit down. But I didn't um, get sick at all. I just had a really? little soreness in my arm. Well, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't feel anything. Yeah. No, it, fortunately, it, was, I mean, it couldn't have been easier. And and just the the freedom, right, of knowing then uh, that that uh, you know after the period passed, I think it's two weeks. Um, that, that I was protected, and more importantly, if I was going to be around loved ones, that that you know we were we were both protected. Um, I wonder when we'll be able to lift. fly without masks on. Me too. We're, <laughs> we're obviously closely following that. Um, the the guidance is a little different on airplanes, just because the environment's a little different. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're in a, uh, a a theater or, or or a bar or something, and and you don't feel safe, uh, you're not sure what's going on with somebody sitting next to you. You can get up and leave. That's obviously not the case on an airplane. But uh, you know, again, as we reach better numbers on vaccines. Uh, each, each day we get closer to those goals, uh, the closer we are to being able to have masks be optional on airplanes too. And I, you know, now that I'm traveling more, I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to that. And I think a lot of Americans are.
You know, uh, uh, Secretary Pete, U.S. intelligence agencies delivered a report on uh, unidentified aerial phenomena mm-hmm. to Congress last Friday. Yeah. What you know about extraterrestrials? Talk to us. I don't know much about extraterrestrials. I do know about the national airspace, which uh, we're in charge of, of keeping safe. And, and so most of our interest in, in, in this report is, is based on that. Uh, you know, the things, I mean, not just unidentified phenomena, but just things like drones. There, there are a lot of new things coming to the airspace, uh, which They is, didn't rule out aliens, though. Mm-hmm. They didn't say it wasn't. Can't rule it out. Right. Um, <laughs> Come on, you in the administration. I know you got some dirt. <laughs> I don't have any special insights on it. I mean, you know, the, the, the paradox has always been um, why haven't we why haven't we encountered uh, uh, in, in a real kind of concrete, verified way? I think we have. Um, I think this government has. But think about the math, right? The fact that the I government mean, said, I don't know, like we don't know. We're not ruling anything out, but we don't know. Y'all never talk. We talk like that all the time. No, they don't. <laughs> they always try to come up with some type of explanation. Just a simple, we don't know. But we don't, right? Mm. Or at least I don't. I mean, look, the, the strange thing is that you do the math on the, the billions and billions of galaxies and solar systems and planets right. out there, and it seems mathematically impossible that we're alone. Absolutely. But then it also doesn't seem to mathematically add up that we haven't had any kind of what we would consider kind of normal contact. Maybe we have. Some people have. Y'all got spies, um, right? America has spies that infiltrate places. Other countries have spies that infiltrate places. Yeah, like foreign terrorist networks, not other planets. But Extraterrestrials I might have spies too. They <laughs> might be walking go, around amongst us. Space? Oh yeah, oh in a heartbeat. Yeah. You would? Yeah, when I was a kid, that's all I wanted to be was an astronaut. <laughs> and then I uh, found out my eyesight wasn't really compatible with that. But uh, but yeah, and by the way, commercial space travel is becoming a thing too. We have an office of commercial space trans- uh, travel in the department. Oh, maybe uh, they'll let you go and just check it out. That's a thought. <laughs> <laughs> so you believe in extraterrestrials? <laughs> I mean, if you just do the math, it's hard to believe that we're alone in the universe. Uh, I, I don't know that I can look at a blurry, you know, uh, white <laughs> dot on a mm-hmm. piece of Navy footage and say, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's a visitor from another planet. But, but uh, you know, it, it stands to reason just based on the math. So that's a yes. Yeah, that's a you, yes. That's the headline. Yeah. And if you yeah, believe in God, right? <laughs> yeah. Because you look at how diverse the Earth is and all of the different forms of life on the Earth. Like, you don't think the galaxies and universes are just as diverse? That's the thing, right. And maybe so diverse that, that forms of what might count as life are not exactly what we think of mm-hmm. uh, uh, the, in, in the forms of life that we're used to dealing with. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you, it's just like you say, I mean, th- there's so much vastness just on this planet that we've got, just in this country that mm-hmm. we've got, that if you then allow yourself to think about the billions and billions of planets and, and galaxies that are out there, um, who knows what what's out there in creation that, mm-hmm. that we can barely even begin to understand. You know, we talk about, uh, I, I keep hearing like, you know, this, this democracy is at stake in this country, right? Yeah. Do you, do you believe that? Yeah, absolutely. So why don't Democrats act like it? We do. We are. We don't. We are. Look, we're, we're voting for and pushing for all of the measures that will make our democracy more secure. We're not always getting our way, but we are pushing for this with, with everything that we've got. And it should, by the way, it shouldn't just be a Democrat thing. Right. It, it should be of concern to people in every part of the political spectrum that our democracy remain a democracy because the freedoms that, that characterize America depend on the vote. Our safety, you know, the safety of a citizen from their own government depends on the vote because that's how you exercise. That's how you make sure that the government works for the people mm-hmm. and not the other way around. And I even think it's it's at stake in the day to day stuff I do. So it, it, it might not seem like the you know Department of Transportation is on the forefront of, of uh, democracy promotion. And in, in many ways, that's that's uh, for other parts of the administration. But I know the president believes that we're being tested right now in a way that we're being tested as to whether democracies can deliver the way that authoritarian regimes can deliver, right? So uh, China, for example, right, may, sh- saying, look, our top-down command and control system produces things like a train that can go the same distance as Chicago to Atlanta from Beijing to Shanghai in about four hours. And that becomes a test not only of which country has a better uh, transportation system, but it becomes a test o- over which country has a better political system. Mm-hmm. When in the 1930s, when democracy was really being called into question. And there were some Americans who were getting interested in this fascism that was arising in Europe. It was, it was actually kind of fashionable, right? And one of the things they said about Mussolini after his fascist takeover of Italy in, in the years be- before we'd gotten to, to World War II, but it'd been in those years in the 30s when it was uncertain whether democracy was really the way to go. 
one of the things they would say in favor of Mussolini was, well, he makes the trains run on time. You know that expression, making the trains run mm-hmm, on time? That, mm-hmm. that goes back to what people said about fascist Italy. Mm. And they were impressed because it seemed efficient. It seemed orderly. It seemed effective. And I always think about that, that transportation example being used at the time, being invoked as a justification for an anti-democratic system. So in a way, us being able to prove that that we in this system, in this country can deliver everything from a train that runs on time to a reduction in child poverty to racial justice, and that we can do that on democratic terms better than it can be done on authoritarian terms. That's kind of the ball game. So why are Democrats okay playing in the sandbox with the fascists though? Because if what you said, what you said is absolutely true, you know, uh, democracy being at stake should be a bipartisan issue that both sides want to fix. Clearly, it's people on the other side who don't want to fix it. So what does that tell you? It tells you that we might be alone in some of these measures that we've got to undertake. It shouldn't be, and I, I would like to believe eventually it won't be. Whether we're talking about protecting our democracy or protecting our climate. I'd like to believe the only competition will be between the Republican I- idea on how to do it and the Democratic idea on how to do it. Obviously, we're not there. How do you, do you weed out- Donald Trump's uh, influence with the Republicans? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, I would, I imagine, I don't know. I, I can't speak for, for Republicans in, in the House or in the Senate. Um, I imagine many, if not most of them, would love to be free of him and his influence, but um, we are where we are. How do you weed out people who seem to be okay with potential authoritarian control? You defeat them. It doesn't seem that easy. It's not that easy, but it's the only way, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we believe, by definition, if we believe in democracy and we have our imperfect democracy to work with, then the only way to, 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 win the day for democracy is to use that democracy to defeat the people who are against democracy. Mm -hmm. And that means securing access to the vote. That means delivering when that democracy hires you to do a job, even if it's something as unglamorous as fixing a bridge. Mm -hmm. And it means being really clear and resolute on what's at stake. But this is, this has to be a whole of society concern too. This can't just be debates among politicians in Washington. Democracy at the end of the day is about everyone in every community taking the power that that, that our democratic system places in their hands and using it. And I still believe that that not only can happen, but but that it has to happen. Um, And if it doesn't, we're in trouble. Now, you know what else we're coming off of right now? Derek Chauvin getting sentenced to 22 and a half years. I wanted to get just your personal thoughts on that sentence, did you think that that was enough? What are your thoughts about it? I mean, I think the, 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 the really important thing, it's important that he was convicted and that he was sentenced and that he will be imprisoned for this murder. I think the bigger issue is seeing how much it took to have that happen this one time, right? To, to have witnessed the murder, the whole country witnessed the murder in video that was indisputable and still be wondering whether there would even be a conviction, let alone a meaningful sentence shows you that there have been so many other incidents where justice was not even close to being served. Uh, But I also think America has noticed that. And I think that is motivating a lot of change. So I don't want to be naive about it. But I believe that there's a consciousness in America that this entire episode of of, of the murder and, and the conviction and the sentencing has brought us a step closer. You know, you've given us a lot of examples this morning of just like this systemic racism in this country. Yeah. Why do you think it's so hard for like politicians just to say America's a racist country? You heard Tim Scott say America's not a racist country. Vice President Harris said America's not a racist country. Uh, Jim Clyburn said America's not a racist country. Why is it so hard just to tell the truth? I think the issue is if, if you just go out and say America is a racist country, it feels like you're denouncing every American and every part of America. And at the same time, it's a clear and obvious truth that racism has been woven into the ways of life of this country from the beginning, from before the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and I mean, enslavement was here 400 years ago, which is before the Constitution, before the Declaration. And I think, you know, this is part of this uh, unfortunate political game that's being played with critical race theory, too, mm-hmm. which is, uh, I think, a, a political strategy that has arisen in certain conservative circles to 
take anybody who is being honest and critical about patterns of racism in this country and use it to say that you are now against this country, mm -hmm. right? That it's anti-American to talk about racism in America. When, I mean, I think it was Lincoln who said, it's not my country right or wrong, it's my country where right to be kept right and where wrong to be put right, right? If, if you love a country, part of how you express that love is to face what's wrong with it and do something about it. That's right. You can't hear what you don't reveal. Right. But if people think you're denouncing them, they can't even hear you when you're asking them to look at the harms that need to change. And I think that's why this language has become so difficult. But it's impossible to like, you know, have an honest conversation about the system of America and not point out that it was built on racism. Clearly, it's it's right there. I think- So how would you answer that question? I'm gonna ask you, Secretary Pete, is America a racist country? I'd say racism is not all there is to America, but it's part of the American story, not just part of our history, but part of our present. And that means that for America to be an anti-racist country, all of us had a lot, have a lot of work to do, because it's not. So you're saying America is not? Not an anti-racist racist country. country. I, hmm. I think when you go out and say a sentence like America is a racist country, people won't be able to hear the truth about where racism sits in America because they'll think you're saying that everything about America is sinister. It is though. For the most everything part. about America? Yeah. I mean, think I about it. When, these, when they sat down and wrote the constitution, they weren't thinking about anybody in this room. You're, I'm black, you're a gay person, Angela Yee's a, a woman, Dramos is Latino. It was for straight white males for the most part. They weren't thinking about anybody in this room. So how could something like that be for everybody? Because they created a system obviously an imperfect and, and, and in many ways deeply troubled system, but... They said liberty and justice for all while still saying we were three-fifths of a human. Right. In the same document. Right. But we, but, but leaders were able to use that document as an instrument for justice later on. That's the incredible thing about it, right? Even where it was written by people who were perpetuating a deeply racist structure in, in enslavement and so many other things that were going on. Mm -hmm. They put into that document the tools to change it. That's the best thing about the Constitution, the fact that it can heal itself. Um, you know, we used, if you do the math on average across American history, we've done a constitutional amendment, a substantive one, roughly once every decade. But in the last 50 years, we haven't done, there was one very technical one. But Isn't basically, the three fifths is still in there, right? Is it the three fifths compromise. Um, well, obviously, that's not you know that that's not the law of the land. But but yeah, I mean, you you can look in the text of the Constitution and see a lot of the evidence of the racism of the men who wrote it. I, I'm not disputing that for a minute. But there, I still believe of, of all the ways that you could set up a country, what we have in terms of the tools that we have to make the country better, and that have been used to end enslavement, to empower women, to uh, uh, to deliver voting rights, to, to make it possible for a guy like me to get married, right? All with a fight, though. Always with a fight. <laughs> Always, with, Always a fight. with a fight. Right, but the ground that we fight on, that Constitution, I mean, it's not like, it's not like anybody in that room, even though some of them I'm sure were gay, but it's not like anybody in that room in the 18th century writing the Constitution fully understood that they were writing it in a way that one day the U.S. Supreme Court could look to that Constitution and use it, uh, uh, interpret it as a document that gave a guy like me a right to marry, right? But they did. I mean, they, it was in there. That's the elegance of the system. And I think the elegance of the system needs to be balanced against the, the, the evils that have been in this country from, from the beginning. And that's why I think it is better to think of how America can become an anti-racist country than to get caught up in the word games that other people want us to play. Do you, do you, do you ever stop and think to yourself that on January 6th, there was an attempted coup of American government and not a damn thing has happened to those people in a real significant way? Well, some of them are going to jail. Are they um, really? Like, are they going to get real well, we'll, time? We'll find out. Um, but yeah, I mean, every time I look at the Capitol, I think about it. Like I the first one we saw got a fine or some, something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, this is a, people went into the United States Capitol for the purpose of overthrowing an election. White people. Violently. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, I mean, in, in some ways, I think we haven't processed that as a country. How not? 
right? How not, though? Secretary Pete was an attempted coup. They wanted to hang the vice president of yeah. the United States of America. Imagine and how horrifying that is when you were there that day and you worked there and you feel like your yeah. life was in and danger you know, and then I've, there's no repercussions. You acted like it was a bunch of just kids wilding at spring break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, and I, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people who were there, were members of Congress, t- staffers, people who were there. Um, it was, you know, many of them feared for their lives that day. And I think all of us feared for our democracy mm-hmm. that day. Um, but you know, the processing that is going to take the better part of our lifetimes. You know, you know, the next one's going to be even worse because of the fact there was no real consequences and repercussions to this one. Because there will be another time where, or that, we make that sure happens. that doesn't happen. How though? Well, first of all, it's why there do need to be prosecutions and a lot of other steps. But but honestly, it's not just the, the legal consequences, right? Uh, I think political lines have to be drawn too, mm-hmm. and the American people have to say this far but no further and you know that's more of a that's that's a political effort uh, that has to happen but what I know is that if this administration that I'm part of can deliver and make people's lives better and create more jobs and deliver all the way down to just good public transportation all the way up to the most uh, high-minded you know defensive democracy establish that America is back around the world you know, move this country into the future. If we can do that, then I think it will be a reminder that a democratic system where we actually take rights seriously and when, where we take the truth and facts, science seriously, is a better system to live under mm-hmm. than what a lot of other countries are trying to do or what some in this country would prefer. What do you think would have happened if all those people were black that stormed the Capitol on the 6th? I think there would have been a lot of blood. But America's not a racist country. There's a lot of racism in this country. I think mm-hmm. we all know that. Mm-hmm. Oh. You know, it, it seems to me Republicans have been planning for 2022 way before Trump left office. So what are Democrats, you know, doing to, like, maintain the position of power they have in the Senate and gain more seats in the House? So I'm, for the first time in about a decade, I'm way less involved in the campaign side because I'm, I'm uh, uh, an official. Um, so I think about it just in terms of delivering. Uh, I know other very smart minds are thinking about the politics of it, the organizing, the tactics, the fundraising, the communications. But inside the administration, what we're thinking about is do a good job. I mean, it sounds simple, but I really believe that if if we just deliver, if American life gets better because this administration is here, which I think it already has, and we keep doing that, then I would like to believe that will be rewarded by being rehired to, to do the work. How, if y'all don't get no proper like voter, you know, voter, voter, voter rights bills passed? Well, obviously we're on trying to get good legislation, but that's also a step that you see not for any kind of partisan advantage, but because it's the right thing to do mm-hmm. uh, with things like judicial action to make sure that there is no uh, racially targeted voter law that can stand in this country. Because again, if if black voters or any voters are not voting for a certain party, then that party has an obligation to try to earn those votes, mm-hmm. not suppress them. Mm-hmm. Could you see yourself running for president again in the future? I don't know. I'm I'm really absorbed in in the job that I have, and and but I, I know it. you have those aspirations. I could see. Yeah, but you don't run for the presidency just because you want to have it. Uh, like when when I ran in in 2020 2019 for the 2020 race, it was because I saw this moment mm-hmm. where there were things happening in this country that I thought I could speak to in a way that was different from the others. And uh, and I felt like what I brought to the table and what was needed, they lined up. And every time I've run for office, it's been like that. There's mm-hmm. the, the office looked like it needed something. I felt like I had something and they fit. And there were a lot of times the opposite happened. I, I, I thought about running for an office or somebody said, you know, would, don't you think you should run for Congress or some office? And I looked at the office and I looked at what I brought and I didn't think they matched. And I just think there's no way to predict right. whether the moment and, and, and what I have and what I have going on in my life. I mean, one of the nice things about uh, uh, stepping away from the campaign trail and especially in the midst of this horrible pandemic, uh, just having more time at home with, with, with Chaston and our dogs and thinking about our future is remembering that there's there's more to life than than, than politics. You haven't so. just celebrated a born day, right? What's that? You said to celebrate a birthday. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, last week we had uh, our anniversary, and then one week later, uh, his birthday. So he's so, a Cancer or is he um, Gemini? 
I don't know. What's you posted no ease. I know you're right. I'm supposed to let you know. 23rd, I think, Cancer. Oh, he's a Cancer. Cancer? Absolutely. Okay. Sensitive, emotional, a lot of tears, I'm sure. I'm a Cancer. That's <laughs> you're in trouble when you right. get home. Yeah, you yeah, didn't yeah. even my, know my, his my, my day is the, <laughs> today, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's that? My birthday is today, actually. Well, it'll be tomorrow, but we'll air this tomorrow. Happy so, yeah. birthday. Yeah. So, oh, that's you. great. Thank you. Thank nice. you. How are you celebrating? But no, it's, it's always good seeing you, Secretary Pete. I know you got a heart out at uh, yeah. 945, but like I always tell you, you know, you still engage with our audience. And I hate when Democrats just start showing up when it's the midterm elections right. or when it's a presidential election. You have to engage with your audience all the time. I think the right does a great job of doing that. You hear them on the talk radio shows all the time. You see them on Fox News all the time. They're always engaging their audience. So... Thank you. For Thanks for having yours. No, it's it's important. We have a pastor of uh, one of our biggest church, biggest black churches in South Bend. I remember him looking right. I went one time to to service, and I remember him looking right at me and saying, "You know, everybody knows how to come to church before an election." Mm. And uh, it was a reminder, mm. a gentle but but important reminder about how important it is to engage all the time. Yeah, and bring uh, attention to what it is that you're working on so people know, because yeah. I think that was a great way to break it down. Yeah. Well, thanks well, for the chance to be here. Well, yeah, yeah. That's, I'll end with this. What was the reason for coming today? What was, the, what, your, what was your absolute reason for wanting to come here today? Because so much in what we're trying to deliver right now is going to make such a difference for the black community. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure. So I'm not in campaign mode. You know, we're not campaigning. I mean, I guess I'm campaigning for an idea or a bill, but, mm -hmm. but I'm not doing party politics. But it's really important to talk about the business opportunity we're going to create, the better policies we're going to create, the history and the future of how things like where highways go affect black neighborhoods mm -hmm. and, and black families. Uh, this is really important to be talking about. And contracts for black companies. Absolutely. To be able to participate in that because that's the kind of thing that creates generational wealth. That's right. When you can get a contract with the city, with exactly. the government to yep. be able to work on transportation. Exactly. Biggest threat to black progress right now is Joe Manchin. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. I'd, I'd be more worried about uh, the other side of the aisle. but. Uh, mm. Okay. We'll see. Secretary Pete, thank you for coming, brother. Thank you. It's Good The Breakfast Club.